So my talk is going to be a little bit more basic. Uh, I'll be sharing my experience with uh, the IELTS Master 700. Uh, I don't have any financial interest in this. Uh, in the modern day cataract surgery era, I think we all know that accurate IOL power estimation is really the heart of uh, modern day cataract surgery. I think our aim is always to have 66 six unaided uh, in the first post-op day. And that is what we're all striving for. So precision biometry is our real hero. And that is why we are all talking, uh, having these sessions here. Let's understand where the prediction of IOL power goes wrong. Uh, we all know that, you know, uh, these are the standard parameters and axial length is something which we have uh, come to terms with. We have got robust instrumentation nowadays so that we can, we can correct these errors here. Whereas the uh, prediction of ELP is still a major concern for us. Although we are using better formula now, uh, but this is something we still we need to improve a lot. Uh, but definitely the modern day formulas are significantly better when we compare it to your previous regression formula, which we were using. And although the modern, uh, the uh, optical biometers and the formula take into account all these parameters, uh, which we feed into it. So my journey has been from contact application, ultrasound to immersion, to IL Master 500 to IL Master 700. So just let me take you through it. So for many years for me, immersion A scan was the gold standard for me. Uh, simply because it was uh, very accurate because we had trained assistants to do that very fast and it was super penetration you know there was absolutely no in, uh, uh, hindrance in any of the density of cataracts which we're using few issues though it was not a very pleasant experience for the patient patient had to lie down the fluid squirting around, around the cheeks and uh, it's a little bit cumbersome and also more importantly for me, it was challenging certain difficulties like our patients with silicone oil, postistephaloma, extreme refractive errors like myopia. And of course, you know, many pseudofakes and affix where we always do scans for both the eyes. It's a rule which we all of us follow. In pseudofake eyes, we want to know the, uh, the biometry, the ultrasound biometers, in spite of using the pseudofake and affake mode, they don't are, give the most reliable results. So these are some of the basic issues with our immersion uh, scans which we're having. Now moving on to the IL Master Final, which I bought uh, about seven to eight years back. And uh, because that, that, that was the era when there nothing was, when the cataract surgery was equal to you know, optical biometry. In many international conferences, whenever we used to go, the only talk used to be about having optical biometers. So I just went and I purchased this. And I had a good experience and the basic advantage, which I felt was the patient experience was very much enhanced. It was fast, it was accurate, and we got access to all the modern formula, which were there in the station itself. But I had one issue with this, uh, simply because, you know, the scan acquisition was not possible in presence of visual access opacities, the central cataract especially PSCs and PPPSCs. Needless to say, the mature white cataracts is not possible. But if, you, if I search the literature, they used to say that only 5 to 10% of cataract patients, according to Western literature. I'm talking about uh, the machines in the pre-swept source OCT era, all the machines, optical biometers, uh, like the Lenstar, IL Master, and other companies as well. But the, this was good enough. My Metro uh, friends, when I had to discuss, they said they didn't have any problem because 80% of your cases, they used to get along with uh, these uh, uh, partial coherence uh, optical biometry itself. But for me, uh, let me tell you my practice profile. I'm from a small uh, district place in Karnataka, which is predominantly a rural population. It's a small, there four city. And majority of my cataracts, 50% of my cataracts are like this. So in my case, you know, it was like I had to use uh, immersion biometry in 50% of my cases because uh, this was a workflow. We used to do an IL biometry in both the eyes in undilated people before. And again, all the patients, we had to go ahead and do an immersion biometry because at least for 50%, we would not get an accurate axial length reading because of the density of the cataracts. And then we had to go ahead and do the uh, immersion biometry and take the results and it was looking well. So next, the, uh, we had the introduction of the IL Master 700 and the Zai's uh, personnel came to me and said, no, uh, this is the next best thing. And, you know, it is, gives every information possible at a, you know, single, uh, in a few seconds. And the, he told that it was a uh, biometry because I had an experience of seven years with an optical biometer. My initial reaction was slightly guarded though. He said, we have got 
excellent fixation checks and telecentric keratometry. Uh, but I just said, you know, uh, the I don't want total K uh, telecentric keratometry. I just want to see whether the the uh, length the IL master seven hundred penetrates my cataracts. So I just asked him. I want a demo. That's what I, I requested him, and they were gracious enough to put the machine for two to three days. And to my surprise, it worked. You know, it was. Uh, it really took me by surprise. There's hardly any cataract which it could not penetrate. So my scan equation dramatically rose from 50% to 90%, even such cataracts. So once I tried on these cataracts, you know, then I realized that you know the swept source technology uh, that was a game changer. You know, literally it's a game changer. So now my ultrasound biometry has come down to very, very, very less. You know, we still do because. Many complex cases will be there where you have a faculitic glaucoma uh, with the trauma and many other issues where still we can't do away with that. But the dependence on immersion biometry is very negligible now. So I think this FEPSO technology, uh, which is incorporated in this IL Master 700, has been a game changer. So irrespective of your patient profile, uh, initially, whenever people used to ask me, I used to tell that it depends upon your patient profile. If you're practicing in an urban place where you know the cataracts are not so dense, uh, and a previous technology machine will also do well for you. But in a in a situation where you know, irrespective of what patient profile comes to you, you want a machine where the scans can penetrate and you can acquire scans in the densest of cataracts uh, with the opaque visual access uh, media. Then I think this web source technology has revolutionized it. Then I try to understand how it works. And you know, it, it just takes 2,000 scans per second at multiple angles. I, I believe it takes around at six angles. And that's the reason why you, we have got these fast scans uh, and which can penetrate the densest of the media. So that has been the most impressive aspect of this, uh, uh, the new uh, machine, uh, 700, compared to the previous generation technology. And uh, uh, apart from this, of course, we are at a at a press of a button. We can have all these parameters, and the comfort level to the patient or the experience of the patient is tremendously enhanced. As Dr. Narayan said, you know, if you have a, a markerless system, you can always get a reference marking even done from this uh, cylinder itself. So it's in general, it's the workflow is tremendously impressive here in this system. Most importantly, I realized that the reliability also definitely is improved com compared to the previous technology. A simple principle like, you know, they always have a compulsory calibration done every single day with this machine. It does, otherwise, it doesn't get in, go and take the first scan itself. And we have the principle of, you know, uh, uh, examining whether fixation is good because we get an OCT scan of the fovea here. The foveal pit is seen when you're uh, trying to take the scan. So it gives us an indication whether the fixation has been good or not, in spite of the presence of a, a dense cataract. So there are a few examples when you repeat uh, the scans of multiple uh, in the same patient multiple times. You can see the uh, you can see that the fixation is always good and repeatability can be uh, demonstrated in all these situations. And it's very easy for uh, for us to train our technicians because they're going to see uh, whether the fixation is there or not. As in this case, the patient is not fixated well here. So we can see that in spite of repeating, because the patient has poor fixation. Uh, you're not able to see the foveal pit. Every time we take a scan, there are going to be errors, as is we are able to see here. So these indicates, you know, they've got significant check marks for us to uh, uh, ensure that, you know, whether the scans are right or wrong. And it's extremely easy for us to train our optometrists for this. The important point is, you know, you can always get the health of the fovea just looking at this. The fixation is all right, but you're not able to see the classical foveal pit. And you have something like this, then you go ahead and do a uh, OCT, you always find something. So you always have an, uh, an indirect way of uh, measuring the macular health in these patients. Although in the modern era, I'm sure before we buy IL Master 700, most of us would have acquired uh, OCT, uh, uh, OCT in our um, hospital. And in our hospital, we always do a routine OCT macula for all cataract patients. But for surgeons who are not doing it on a routine, it can give us a check that you know something is wrong in the fovea. Please go and get it done. So we get a small central foveal image, which can give us clue regarding the uh, the health of the macula. Now, these are the formulas which uh, we are all seeing for long now. And typically, uh, these we have this is the axial length, and we know that you know 
what are the best formula for what axial lengths and as a general consensus among the uh, the formulas the generation four formula are generally more predictable and give uh, more reliable results irrespective of the axial insight among all of this i think we we all know that barrett to universal is has become the current gold standard irrespective of the axial length which should the uh, which are using it so i just before concluding i'd like to just share few practical experience on uh, refractive surprises because in spite of you know having done the best biometry sometimes uh, if you ignore few points important points you may still end up having uh, a surprise so just sh uh, sharing few cases here this is a young uh, male patient who had uh, underwent surgery and in spite of doing what seemed to be an accurate biometry for us he had a residual refractive error of plus 2 and uh, this is patient was extremely unhappy and uh, we had to deal with this but before that we need to analyze what went wrong so when we go back and just see the scans this patient had got the both the immersion and the uh, the uh, isle master done in this patient the axial length was 24.5 approximately and uh, we took we did calculations using multiple formulas and uh, including holiday one but what was ignore what was unique in this patient was uh, we forgot to just have a, a look at the ac uh, depth in this patient you can see dealing with an outlier patient he had a depth of approximately 5 mm here in this and he had a flat case a flat case and a 5 mm extreme depth our estimation of the elp goes wrong and this wasn't uh, taken care into account and we just calculated the intraocular pressure uh, including the barrets so that barrets it showed 20 was the power which it had suggested and we wanted an excellent distant visual acuity for this patient driver so we just but hegi was a formula which had clearly indicated that 22 would be a more appropriate choice in this patient but we overlooked and we had gone ahead and went uh, uh, implanted a 19.5 diopter uh, lens in this patient and this was the residual refractive error and obviously we can't leave the patient uh, like this because he is an nip patient and uh, the next 5 days i think i had to I do an eye exchange, and uh, this was a single piece hydrophobic uh, lens uh, by an indigenous manufacturer. So I just forward it. I just cut it into three pieces, and that is my usual technique. And uh, remove it, and I implant uh, my the the next lens, and I implanted at twenty one point five. I didn't implant twenty two. See, maybe I wasn't sure that even that is going to be uh, correct, uh, but uh, we eventually did that. and let me show you what the outcome was I just forward is for you the lens was implanted and implanted a 21 diopter lens in this patient so post operatively i think we uh, uh, we had a refractive still refractive error of about 0.5 diop uh, diopter years i think the message which i'd like to give here is you no know, we often talk about the axial lens error you know we will choose the formula based on that but not it's not uncommon to find situation where we are dealing with flat case or ac diopter which ac uh, ac depth which is more than 3.5 mm uh, in these eyes these are outliers you know most of the formulas assume that the anterior chamber depth is uh, between 3.5 to 2.5 and care of that so in these outliers we need to be extra careful one more case uh, example again we have a, a an antechamber depth which is slightly more this is a slightly myopic patient and when we do this uh, uh, the each of the formula give a different form uh, different uh, estimated lens power in this patient you have starting from 15.5 to 16.5 and this was a slightly myopic patient uh, i chose the hagis here and i wanted to over correct because i want to leave him a little bit myopic so we decided to go ahead and Use a 17 diopter instead of using 0.5 more. I ended up having a, a residual. A, 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 there was no residual spherical error. So that is the reason why now I would like to conclude by saying that excellence measurement is great, but always keep a, a note on the your K readings and the antechamber depths. So in my experience, I found that in an average of Barrett's and Haggis for eyes with very deep antechambers. Gives a more predictable re, uh, results, and it's better to err on slight overcorrection and 
getting in myopic post op refraction with that i think i'd like to conclude my talk thank you so much for the opportunity thank you sir